Good morning, everyone. Today is July 19th, 2022. Uh, this is APFA's virtual retirement seminar. My name is Josh Black, APFA National Secretary, and I'm also a Philly-based flight attendant welcoming you today. Um, today, we have some really knowledgeable retirement specialists here to help you guys navigate the amazing journey of retirement with all of the information and uh, forms and things like that that go along with it. Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to them. There we go. Good morning. Thank you, Josh. Welcome to the uh, July 19, 2022 APFA National Retirement Virtual Seminar. Uh, my name is Patrick Hancock and this is Kim Coates Tuck. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Kim Coates Tuck is the APFA National Retirement Specialist. I'm the National Retirement Specialist Emeritus. I haven't decided whether that's a good word or a bad word, but we're going to go with it. We also always give a shout out to uh, Ron Harris, and all three of us, by the way, are DFW-based because, you know, it's close to headquarters. Uh, Ron Harris is responsible for an awful lot of the uh, presentation you will hear and see today. And uh, so we always say, hey, Ron, thanks again. That was he and I on a layover. He may have been overserved. If you squint there, you can see that. But yeah, so that's who we are. Who we are not is we are not the company. This is a union meeting. And I have been a union rep long enough that I've developed a rather healthy cynicism toward my employer. And if I say something mean about my employer and it offends you, yeah, okay. Uh, we're also not your financial advisors. You may very well find that you need a financial advisor and we recommend a financial advisor of all the possible advisors, we recommend that the most. Um, there are lots of good financial advisors out there. There's also some pretty shady ones. So you wanna, wanna proceed with a little caution. We're gonna hear from one of our favorite financial advisors later on in the presentation today. Um, we're not your attorneys, we're not your Medicare advisors, we're not your Social Security advisors, and you may find that you uh, need some or all of them, but uh, that ain't us. Now, that's us. Who are we as an organization? Well, as of uh, May, which I think is the most recent set of numbers we have, there are 24,312 members of the APFA. How many of those do you think are over the age of 80, 80? eight decades. You're wrong. The number is 14. We have 14 over the age of 18, uh, 80, 18. <laughs> over the age of 18, <sighs> 18 I hope. It's going to be a long <laughs> presentation, folks. Hold up. Buckle in. All right. Uh, 125 uh, in the 75 to 79, 459 in the next bucket. The 1,543 who are up. Uh, and that, that whole group is eligible for uh, Medicare at this point, although they should not take it if they're working. Um, We've got uh, 3,700 and 55 to 59, the largest group with 5,319. So add those all up. There's 11,181 of the 24,000 that are eligible today to retire. So if it seems like your union is spending an awful lot of time and energy uh, to get uh, information out to you, and we spend a lot of time on talking about retirement and your options, uh, that's why is because uh, we are probably the largest special interest demographic out there. I love going through the rest of these slides here and looking at, you know, the spread. Uh, it gets pretty thin and uh, then it starts get, uh, getting uh, pretty, pretty filled up again. And uh, you'll notice that that last little bucket is beginning to fill up again. It's funny because when we don't hire people age out of that bucket and it gets to be a small bucket. But that's uh, probably my favorite slide in the presentation to, to take a look at who we are. All right. Hey, Kim, can we do, tell us about housekeeping. Okay, housekeeping. Well, it's good to know that the good slide handout um, that you can download from the APFA website or you can uh, ask us to mail one to you if you prefer a paper copy and don't want to print it out yourself. It follows this virtual presentation. So you don't have to take notes if you don't want to because everything should be covered in the handout if you get a copy of the handout. If you have questions, just submit them back. We're happy to answer them and we will stop for questions several points during our presentation today. Checklists in the back of the good slide handout if you have it or if you decide to get it, there are some very useful checklists. Um, what you need to do 
90 days out, 60 days out, if you're planning to retire soon, 30 days out, immediately after retirement. Also, a list of contacts is there as well, and the most useful contact of all would be retirement at APFA.org. This is very important because uh, these days the company seems to be very siloed, and, and you have to call multiple locations to get information, even if you can get that information, and we kind of pull it all together for you. Um, so if you're not sure who to call to notify about retiring, where to get your pension information, and so on, we can help you out with that. All right, so what does retirement really mean? We like to kind of divide the retirement into several buckets, and the first one being medical benefits. Uh, the next one would be your regular retirement benefits, such as your past privileges. And the third is your pension and 401k. But we had to switch that around because not everybody has a pension these days. So 401k is going to be the primary source of income during our retirement. Now, the medical benefits, we like to refer to that as the incredible shrinking basket because basically as a result of bankruptcy, everybody's medical benefits were impacted and reduced, pretty much non-existent now. But we still have to think about medical benefits when we're retiring. All right, so important questions we need to ask. What do you need to retire? What do you get in retirement? What about income? And what else do I need to research? All those annoying little details that you still have to think about once you've done the big three. Um, these are what we're gonna cover in our presentation today. So what do you need to retire? Well, you need to be eligible. You need money, that's a biggie. And you need to be ready. First and foremost, lots of people I talk to, they have, you know, they're eligible, they've been eligible a long time, they got the money, but they're just not ready to leave the flight attendant lifestyle behind. All right, so eligibility, let's cover that. In order to be eligible, you must have at least 10 years of company seniority based on your date of hire, and your age plus your company seniority must equal 65 or more. That's what we refer to as the 65 point plan, and it's the company's criteria for retirement eligibility. So, Patrick, let's talk about money. All you right. Need to money, money. think about in terms of money. Let's when you're talk ready about to money. Okay. If you're uh, doing some long range planning, uh, there are two major questions you have to add, answer. The first is, how much do I need to have saved on the day I retire to last me the rest of my life? The goal. And that's one of the common questions we get is, well, how much should I have? Yes. Yeah. Well, you'll need to talk to your financial planner because that number is different for everyone based on their, di their different uh, needs and wants and position in life. And once you've got that number, the goal, you have to figure out how much do I need to save each year between now and the date I intend to retire to reach that goal. So, and if you're thinking of retiring soon and you haven't begun to think about that, you're going to have more, uh, I think the corporate speak is challenges, uh, and you may be here longer than you would like. Uh, on this slide, my favorite one is the one at the bottom right. I said you held Christmas off. I still aspire to that. But yeah, the general goal is you want to maintain the same lifestyle that you had while you were working. And I'm not happy about that. <laughs> I'm tired of being poor. I want to be one of those wealthy retirees I see in the commercial jetting off to, you know, the beach uh, using their silver sneakers, gym membership. But apparently that's not the plan. Apparently maintain the same lifestyle. So when you got to do this calculation and you're trying to figure out uh, your, your number, you're going to retire at age 65. Well, the first question you need to answer is how long am I going to live? What? What? Come on, come on, what? That's, that, that's not an answer. I mean, that's crazy. That's, that's not really an answer. And this is going to be the most frustrating part about retirement planning, that we want the answer, the right answer. We want it for ourselves. We want it for you know, everyone around us. And there isn't a right answer. There is a good answer. And the difference is, is a good answer is a good estimate. It's a good approximation. It's a good guess. And uh, so I like to call those our guesstimates. And uh, so the first of our guesstimates, how long are you going to live? Your life expectancy in 2022 is 77.3 years. 2020 had the largest decline since World War II. 
Thank you, opioid epidemic. Thank you, COVID-19. Um, and that's 74.5 for men and 80.2 for women. And that is the largest spread difference uh, since the 1920s. Again, uh, this is now uh, would be the opioid epidemic and the uh, old man suicide epidemic. So, yeah. Um, and uh, the less that's going to be less for African-Americans. 7.1 is the average and more for Hispanics. I got all these numbers out of the National Vital Statistics Report, uh, Biome 64, Book 6. That is the best cure for insomnia I ever found in my life. You take that on your labor, you are going to sleep like a baby. Um, and that just becomes the first of our guesstimates. And the problem is, it's just an average. Uh, half of us are going to die sooner than that. Half of us are going to die later. I like to tell the story that uh, I started going gray in high school, which was really annoying. Because, you know, in high school, you're trying to all fit in. And uh, I went home one day and I said, Mom, I discovered this gray hair on my young head is all your fault. Because everything about a man's hair comes on the mother's genes. So what's going to happen next? Am I going to go bald in college? I mean, did any of my uncles or grandfathers or anybody go bald early? She said, oh, honey, none of them ever lived that long. Thanks, Mom. A good genetic heritage is the best gift you can give your children. So which half are you in? I mean, we'd all like to think we're going to be in the half that are going to, uh, you know, live longer than all of our friends, except no, half of us are going to die sooner. And you kind of have to guess that and be honest about it because that's going to impact your planning. So which half are you in? Of course, you know, how long you're going to live is not the only guesstimate. We've got other guesstimates like salary projection because, you know, we know salaries always go up uh, unless you're in the airline industry. Yeah, OK. How about inflation? Because we know inflation always goes up except for the last 11 years. It has come back, though. Uh, investment returns. We know the stock market. Well, yeah, no, not even going there. <laughs> All right. But. So you've got the eligibility. Now comes the hardest question of all. Are you ready to retire? And, you know, you, you need to be ready. Um, we we talked to a lot of people who've already retired. You know, the companies come figured out some new way to screw them. And so they call us and we help them out. And then uh, just about when we're done, I say, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got a question for you. Was it was it right? The right time? Did you did you go when you should have? You know, now that now that you've gone. And like 98, 99%, oh, it's the best thing I ever did. I don't know why I waited. I've got my life is so full. I don't know how I would have ever had time to go to work. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to talk to you. I talk to that one or 2% that are unhappy. Why are you unhappy? What, what, what happened? What, what did you do? Because I don't want to make those same, same trips. And almost inevitably, the problem is they didn't plan. $40,000, man, that'll last me the rest of my life. I'm out of here. Or they took the sudden out. Yeah, yeah, you know the sudden out, that's when your union rep and your supervisor meet you on the jet bridge. And as you're walking up the jet bridge, the union rep says, I got your retirement, I recommend you take it. Yeah, you didn't plan. But I have good news for each and every one of you. You are here, you are planning. You are going to be in the group that is incredibly happy with your retirement. So the question is, have you reached that point? And the problem is, is that we're flying flight attendants. We talk to everybody. We're going to talk to our buddy bidder. We're going to talk to that non-rev on the jump seat we've never seen before. We're going to talk to maybe our spouses, certainly our financial planners, CPAs, all those folks. And they're, they, we're, we're going to ask for their opinion. And because most of them love us and care for us and want the best for us, they're going to give us the answer that's best for them. Because that's just how people work. I mean, only you will really know when you're ready. And sometimes you're really certain, yep, it's time. And sometimes you're just pretty certain. And sometimes you just think it's probably right. But you get to make that decision in most cases. And you should do it when you reach that point. So, questions? All right. First question, retiring, uh, retiring email notice to my manager and got a reply back August 6th and I was awarded a line for August. So this is, uh, yeah, you shouldn't have been awarded a line for August <laughs> if you've notified your manager. So the manager is supposed to send a message to 
the flight attendant admin group and uh, I would call your manager again and say, hey, I'm holding, showing that I've held a line for August and I'm supposed to be retiring, so somebody needs to send the message so I can be recoded. Once you're recoded, if you pull up your HI-10 and Sabre and DEX, um, it will show an RT code on the day that you're going to retire. And then you'll know that everything's good and they should take that line away and give it to some lucky reserve or some open time or something. So um, again, you can, I would also I'd notify my manager if your manager's not around because a lot of people are on vacation right now, it's summer, call the MOD and they will find a manager who's available to take care of it. Also, you can email fa.admin at aa.com. That's the flight attendant admin group and let them know, hey, I notified my manager, but I haven't been recoded to retiree. So um, those are things you can do. And then if you still probably in the next uh, few days, like by next week early, if you haven't been recoded, give me a call and I'll track somebody down to assist you. Okay. I suppose it'd be really tacky to ask if they're good trips, you want to drop them. <laughs> No, but my the first thing tell the trip. They should do is <laughs> I didn't say that. The first thing they should probably do is hop on the phone with someone at their base, like right. their MOD or someone. Their own manager, preferable, because that's who's yeah. supposed to do it. And then if their own manager is unavailable, call the MOD, and the MOD should be able to find a manager who is available okay. who can send the message that they need to be recoded as retiree. Great. Our next question. I'm ready to retire. Great. What's my first step to leave the company? I have years of service and age. Just need to know who I contact first to get the ball rolling. Well, before you even notify the company, there should be another couple of steps you have taken. One is if you have a pension, either a PBGC pension or a legacy AA pension, you should have requested the paperwork for that already because Retiring doesn't automatically start your pension if you have one. So you, if you should have thought about that and getting your income set up, if you've done that, the second thing that you already should have done before you notify the company is figure out what you're going to do for health insurance. If you are over 60, 65 or over and need to go on Medicare or you have Medicare eligibility because of a previous disability, you need to go ahead and set that up to start when your uh, you know, AA insurance ends. So both of those things need to be done before you even notify the manager. But the process for notifying the company is very simple. You call your flight service manager, you tell them, I'm going to retire. Uh, for example, July 31st is going to be my last day as an active employee and August 1st is going to be my first day as a retiree. So you let them know your last day as an active employee, your first day as a retiree, then they're going to want you to follow up with an email to them, to their AA email address, so they have something in writing from you showing that you requested to retire on a specific date. And it's that simple. There's no form. There's no real process. You know, it's just notifying your manager and then following up with an email. So as long as they've made the preparations necessary, all they need to do is contact their FSM, right? Correct. And the date is not necessarily arbitrary, but it doesn't have to be the last day of the month, right? It, it does not. I mean, it, that tends to work best for most people. If, A, they're starting a new form of health insurance or and not going on their spouses, if they're going on their spouses, it really doesn't matter when in the month they retire. Okay. Um, but if they're starting a new, usually it ends, it, tends to work best to finish a month and then start fresh on the next month. And, and the same for the pensions, you know. Um, both the AA and the U.S. Airways pensions, you have to have requested the paperwork in time um, to start it, you know, as of your retirement date. And they both start, we'll cover this later in the presentation, but they both, the pensions both start on the first of the calendar month. And if they've made all the necessary arrangements and everything that you'll be going through later in the presentation. Is it two weeks? They two like years? to have two weeks notice at the least, at the very least. They prefer between 30 days and two weeks notice. But if you have to retire suddenly, um, there's really nothing legal, you know, nothing illegal about it. You can do that. We've had plenty of people say, I need to retire right away. 
if I fly another trip, you're going to see me in the news and I don't want that <laughs> to happen. So you can retire. You can call your manager and say, I'm going to retire tomorrow, but it's preferable to give them at least the two weeks notice. That's all the questions we have. OK, so I guess I'm up. So we've covered one of our important questions. What do you need to retirement? Now we're going to move on to what do you get in retirement? So what do you get in retirement? You get travel privileges, such as they are. You get paid for your vacation and sick time. You get a retirement gift. You get the status of being a retiree. And you get the option, as long as you're between ages 55 and 65 and not yet eligible for Medicare, to purchase some really expensive retiree medical insurance. So let's cover travel. You get D1, D2R, D2P, D3, AA20, and 20% off Advantage tickets. And I, I wanted to point out you, the D2R is unlimited. The D1s are regular D1s. They do not have an R after them. You get the same number of D1s that you had as an active employee. You only get half the number of D3s that you had as an active employee. All non-rev travels booked through the non-rev travel planner on the AA Retirees website, which is www.retirees.aa.com. That is to where you will go for everything um, American Airlines related when you retire. So your payroll information that you need for your taxes, your non-rev travel planner, if you want to order a um, retiree ID card, all that stuff is on the retirees website. Um, on travel, your service charges and taxes are charged to your credit card like they are now. And obviously, if you have D3s traveling, you should have them put in their own credit card number so that you are not charged for their travel fees. Zed Travels book through My ID Travel, which is also available on the retirees website. Unfortunately, and it's so sad, and this delays retirement for a lot of us, there's no more jump seat authority and no more uh, known crew member authority. So that's a big bummer. Um, there are some non-rev friendly travel agencies, such as Perks and Dargal. If you're into cruising, our uh, friend non-rev, uh, non-rev, Ron Harris, who is a non-rev says that he took a cruise on through perks from Galveston and made him feel so good because he was the youngest and cutest one on the whole ship. So I think there would be a lot of gray hairs like me and Patrick on those cruises and you'll feel adorable if you go. So Ron's a Ron rev then. Ron's a Ron, Ron rev. rev. Yep. I like that. <laughs> so also pre-check and global entry. Now, if this works out timing wise, if it's about to expire and you're still haven't given your notification that you're going to retire, hey, put it in and get the company to pay for it one more time, you know. But that only works if the timing is right. If you want to go tomorrow, you're not going to, your manager's not going to approve to get your global entry redone again. So um, if you think ahead and planning six months out or a year, then that, that's a possibility. All right, sick time and vacation. So unused sick time is paid off at a rate of $8.65 per hour. Not a good rate at all. We always recommend that people use their sick time and get the full benefit of it before they retire. And normally, once you're eligible to retire, there are a few things that you need to use your sick time for before you leave. So just keep that in mind. You're not going to get the full benefit of your sick time in terms of pay if you wait to use it or wait to get paid out for it when you retire. All right, your unused and accrued vacation is paid out at four hours per day. That's the contractual rate at your rate of pay, as long as your vacation is seven days or more. If it's six days or less, you only get paid out at $3.50, oh, sorry, not $3, three hours, three and a half hours per day at your rate of pay. It's summer, Patrick and I are having vacation <laughs> difficulties, so. Three, uh, three hours, three and a half hours per day at your rate of pay, the contractual rate for six days or less. Now, most people, when they're retiring, have at least seven days of vacation. It's very rare that you would see less. But um, so you don't lose anything on your vacation when you retire. It's like a mini vacation buyback, basically. You're not eligible um, 
when you retire for the employer 401k match, but from your last paychecks, such as your vacation payout, your final paycheck, you are eligible for the employee um, matched into your 401k. So if you choose to, you know, you're going to get paid out for a bunch of vacation and you don't want a huge tax uh, implication, you can always adjust the amount you have put into your 401k before you get that final paycheck. Um, so there you are, not eligible for the employer match, but you are eligible for the employee the deductions. All right, so, and I just talked about changing it. I'm ahead of myself on the presentation. All right, retirement gift. You contact your manager within the last 30 days prior um, to your retirement to request your retiree gift catalog. Usually when you're notifying the manager is a good time to remind them, hey, and you also need to order my retiree gift catalog. The catalog comes with a commemorative certificate. Yay, shows your years of service. Make sure they get that right. Shows your name and it's a nice thing. It's frameable. Um, also, option to choose your own gift and there are is a wide array, array of choices. Now, here's an example of one of them. Very popular, the crystal tail and Patrick. It's always good to have a nice tail around the house. <laughs> okay, moving on. You also get the fact that your status is changing from that of sky goddess to, wait for it, cat rancher. That's Patrick me. and I are aspiring to that status, and my sister Laura is already there. She's got a lot of cats. Anyway, uh, just, you know, you're going to be a little more leisurely, and your status and lifestyle is going to change a little bit, but still going to be fun. I talked to one girl who said, hey, I lied when I started working for American Airlines. I said I love people. I love to travel. And I figured out that I hate people and I hate to travel, but I love dogs and I'm going to go spend my days of retirement at a dog rescue and I don't ever have to deal with people again. I'm going to enjoy the dogs. So your status could change in such a way if that's what you want to do. All right. So retirees uh, can submit an online request for their retiree ID. You can use it for discounts on shipping, such as your FedEx discount for hotels and car rentals. Um, a government issued ID is required photo ID for travel. So this is not your ID to travel. It's just your ID for discounts and so on. You can take it when you travel and <laughs> let everybody know that you're a retiree so they'll treat you fabulously, one would hope, but it's not required for travel. So. Um, Make sure you have your driver's license or your passport with you when you're traveling. Um, it allows you access, oh, you'll have access to the AA retirees site that I mentioned already, www.retirees.aa.com. Um, also, it will have your payroll access, your employee pay portal, or the archive of ePays or paperless pay if you need to go back that far. We're getting close to the point where people may not need to go back that far for their taxes anymore. And uh, it will be a little bit more uh, straightforward. Also, your detailed sequence history is not available on the retirees website. So if you want to print up your sequence history for the last year or so, uh, that you would need to do prior to your retirement. Okay, if you're not able to retire, you can just quit. What you would need to do if you're feeling a little grumpy and you just think, like I said before, I need to quit tomorrow or something bad's going to happen. Um, you simply give notice to your flight service manager. Your vacation will be paid out at the contractual rate. You won't lose anything on your vacation. Um, if you qualify for an LAA pension, you'll need to contact the AA Pension Service Center to find out when you can commence that pension. If you're an LUS flight attendant with the PBGC pension, you need to reach out to the PBGC and find out when you're eligible to start your pension if you're not already double dipping. Um, if you're not, since you're not retiring, if you just quit, your sick time will not be paid out. So you'll lose out on any sick time. So if you're just going to quit and you know, have a lot of sick time, you might have to feel a little ill before you quit. Anyway, just saying. All right, any questions? Yes. And this is also the time we're going to have we'll John join us after our first questions here. All right. 
Um, we have a leftover question that came through for the last portion. Is there a grace period in which you can change your mind, uh, basically after you've given notice to the company on the, retirement? We generally describe grace period as midnight the day prior to uh, when you're leaving. So if you're leaving on the 30th, uh, midnight of the 28th is generally the deadline. You can maybe get away with changing your mind on the 29th, but you gotta remember, uh, once you start that ball rolling, there are things that are gonna happen. If you change your mind at the last minute, it may take a little bit to uh, to undo them. Okay. Yeah, and I always say, you know, don't leave it. You're, it, it the likelihood of you really being able to rescind your retirement the same day that you were, or the day before you were intending to retire is not very likely, you know. I would say 48 hours, yeah. you know, would be a good, you know, technically you could do it up to midnight night on the day, but you have to track down somebody to do it. And once it's processed, um, basically it's not gonna, you know, as long, once it goes through, the, you can't rescind it anymore. So I would say realistically 48 hours, because you have to find a manager who's gonna rescind it for you. Okay. All right, um, good information. How may we purchase an upgrade for a VIOP ticket? You can't purchase an upgrade for a VIOP ticket. You can put in for an upgrade, but you can't purchase an upgrade for a VIOP ticket. And uh, I think you're automatically put in for an upgrade. I'm not sure, but. Uh, I was just thinking of a smart aleck response, like I'll send them my Venmo. And he said, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Great. We'll see if they get it. Josh will <laughs> take the money. No, oh, that's funny. You may not get the upgrade. <laughs> that's a uh, processing fee. That's the price. That's right. Um, next question. Will my dependents have travel benefits after I retire? Your dependents will still have travel benefits after you retire. Yes. They'll still be able to have any, you know, underage dependents can be a D2s, your spouse, your registered companion, one or the other, and then you, you still have D3, but as I mentioned before, you just have half the number of D3 um, passes that you had as an active employee. Great. Um, when you retire, do you use your, lose your registered guests? You do not. They're all still in there. It just gets transferred over to the retiree's website when you retire. If a person has FMLA and the FMLA issue or issues get worse and job performance becomes very difficult, how do you apply for leave approval and can an individual exhaust their accrued sick time, therefore getting paid via sick time until their sick time has been exhausted? Yes, I mean, if you are having health issues, that's absolutely what we would recommend um, for, there's a new system for getting your absences approved. It's called uh, Absence Tracker. And the best person to call about that would be the health, health rep on duty here at APFA because uh, that was a new system that was implemented in the last few months. And uh, the health department here, the health reps have the most up-to-date information about how to do how to go about that. But we do recommend that if you're you're sick and you don't think you're going to be able to come back to work, you should stay out on medical leave and use up your sick time prior to your retirement. And you can retire from paid or unpaid medical leave. You don't have to get back active on, you know, the payroll or anything in order to retire. Right. And I just dropped the phone number for APFA headquarters into the chat. You can just follow the prompts. For the health rep on the health duty. Rep on duty. Okay. Um, there was a second portion to that. Does AA subtract seniority from you due to any FMLA usage upon retirement? AA does not subtract company seniority. So your ability to be eligible to retire under the 65 point plan would not be affected. That right, that stays intact. Now, back in the day uh, with L American Airlines, legacy American Airlines prior to, I don't know when, they did take some company seniority away, but that ha hasn't happened for a long time. So there may be some people that took leaves a long time ago that were impacted um, and lost some company seniority. I know I did. I took some education leaves and stuff like that, and I lost a bit of company seniority. So, um, but these days you don't lose any company seniority if you're out on medical leave. So if you go out and you're already eligible, you know, you're still going to be eligible from medical leave. One of the uh, 
histories behind that question or that rumor in the galley is that uh, in the old LAA pension and actually in the all the LUS pensions as well, there's a formula for determining how much your pension is going to be. And we have seniority, you know, years of, of, of eligible pensionable seniority, and then you have the magic multiplier, and then you have your earnings. And the thing that most people ran into is, well, I didn't fly for a couple of years because I was on an FMLA leave or whatever, but I also wasn't getting paid. Well, that reduced that number, the earnings. So your pension wasn't what you anticipated because your earnings went down. And so some people translated that as, well, I'm being punished for taking FMLA. No, no, your, your pension's going down because it reflects your earned income and your earned income went down. So the main thing FMLA gets you, if you're on an FMLA, and I know there's a lot of confusion about this, um, you're always also on a medical leave if you're on an FMLA. The only thing the FMLA gets you is that if you're, um, it's not going to be an, a, an occurrence for attendance. And if you're, you know, it can make your benefits last a little bit longer if you have FMLA and you're, you know, getting to a point that 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 wouldn't really affect most people on medical leave here. So it, it keeps your you on your benefits for 12 months if you've gone on an unpaid medical leave and um, FMLA would run out after three months, about 84 days, I think it is. So, so the main benefit the FMLA is going to get you is the ability to use your sick time or the ability to be off on medical leave without it being an attendance occurrence. All right. Uh, upon retirement, the current contract provides for only 865 for each hour of accrued sick leave. Is APFA actively seeking an improvement to that outdated rate? Well, I would suggest that you contact the negotiating team and let them know if that's a crucial issue for you. It is on my list of issues that I submitted to the negotiating team. So, yes, uh, I would actively be trying to get it changed. I don't know where it's Negotiate at APFA.org. Negotiate at APFA.org. Also, another suggestion would be perhaps having some sort of a way to convert those sick hours into a health account that we could use towards our future retiree health benefits. You know, so there are things that are being suggested to the negotiating team. How it will shake out, we still don't know, but the more people that um, contact the negotiating team and let them know that that's an important issue to them, the more likely it is to happen. Speaking of health benefits, we've got a question in, and I know we're going to go through some of the options um, a little bit later in the presentation. The question is, if I retire at 62, what health insurance can I get till I'm 65? Yeah, we'll cover that later, it, you know, so. And then. Um, so don't remind me of that one again when we get there. Perfect. At retirement time, can I liquidate 401k without paying taxes? Um, you at retirement at retirement time, uh, you can either leave your 401k right where it is and just manage it the way you've always managed it with those really good rates that we have because it's a huge group, or you can roll it into a uh, another tax deferred account, uh, like an IRA, or if you have access to some of those weird little you know 401b kind of stuff. Uh, but if you take the money out, you will pay. Uh, income tax and that money because it is income tax. And if you are not yet 59 and a half, you will pay a penalty for taking it out with a couple of possible uh, narrow exceptions in there. So uh, that's kind of a not really answer. Okay, that is our current questions for this section. All right. Okay, so were we going to let John come yeah, in? Yeah, perfect. We've got John LaSquadro from the AA Employee Federal Credit Union flagship financial group, and he's going to talk to us for a few minutes about some of the services, financial planning services that the credit union has to offer. Good morning, everybody. Can everyone hear me? We yeah. can. Thanks, John. Fantastic. Well, thanks again for including me. I'm with the flagship financial group which is uh, a department within the American Airlines Credit Union. Um, I'm a financial advisor slash retirement specialist, and I help American Airlines employees as well as any employee of the airport or the airline industry with retirement planning and investment planning. Uh, my territory technically is the East Coast from Virginia on up to Maine. Uh, we have financial advisors and retirement specialists 
expand out across the country. And if you are in an area um, outside of the East Coast or the Northeast, I'd be happy to give you the phone number of the flagship financial group where they can connect you with one of the financial advisors. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about what we do. We do mainly retirement planning for American Airlines and um, other airline and airport employees. Re retirement planning includes reviewing your, uh, your pension, if you're eligible, re uh, reviewing your social security choices, establishing goals, looking at any other retirement resources you may have, such as your 401k, annuities, IRAs, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, gold, silver, whatever you have, we put it all in the pot to see what sort of retirement all of that will provide for you. And then we can, of course, also put in suggestions as to how to improve that overall retirement plan. Do you need to save more? Do you need to wait longer? Uh, do you need to invest a little differently? These retirement reports or analysis that we do, no charge for our credit union members as long as you're in good standing. The only the uh, requirement is you have at least five dollars in a savings account or checking account at the credit union, and you're qualified. Um, one of the things we also focus on this is maybe a little tip for a lot of people is we look at how much pre-tax money you have in your 401ks and elsewhere, as well as Roth money. Um, Patrick alluded to a second ago that anytime you take money out of an IRA, a 401k, if you take a distribution. It's a taxable event. So um, I suggest considering a Roth IRA or the Roth 401k, and it's eligible uh, if you're with American Airlines, of course, you have a, a Roth option available. And the benefits, as you may know, is that the contributions, although post-tax, meaning no tax benefit up front, the investments will grow tax-free for as long as you live. That means you do not have to pay taxes when you take the money out. You don't, you're not subject to the required minimum distribution at age 72. So what happens a lot when we do uh, retirement plans for people, we show money coming out of their 401ks or IRAs and they have to pay taxes on it. And many of them complain. In fact, it's the number one complaint I get from retirees. Why am I paying so much in taxes? So I say, well, you're taking money out of your 401k. You're getting social security. You getting a pension probably. If you are if you have a spouse or a significant other, you're filing jointly, they have a social security of their own, perhaps a pension. That's a lot of income coming in. Maybe your tax bracket won't drop as much as you thought during your retirement, so you've got to pay taxes. There's not a lot of write-offs available in your retirement years. If you have a home, likely, or a mortgage rather, you've likely paid it off. Your kids are likely gone. There's really not a lot of other retirement, uh, or rather tax deductions available. I often joke with people saying, well, you should, you could have another kid. Or that was a joke if anyone's laughing. Um, you could, uh, I also say then, you should have done a Roth 20 years ago. And so I'm telling everyone who's listening here, strongly consider using the Roth, perhaps starting off with a few percentage points, one, two, three percent into a Roth, increase a little bit each year, every six months maybe, so that we've got a nice bucket of Roth money that's not gonna be taxable that we can use as a strategy when we ultimately retire. So here's my phone number if you'd like to go through this retirement exercise. Uh, my phone number is 718-487-6736. I'll repeat it, 718. 487-6736. Again, my territory, anyone who lives between Virginia and Maine on the East Coast, um, I'm happy to help with your retirement plan. If you live outside that area and you'd like to be uh, in touch with a financial advisor, retirement specialist from the flagship financial group, you can call our general number and they're located in Dallas. The number is 877-832- 6334. That number again, 877 832 6334. That's all I have for you today. I wish you all luck in your retirement planning. If I'm involved, I'm happy to help. And I uh, thank you very much for your time.
Thank you, John. Hey, I'm putting in the chat for everyone these contact ins information. What was your zone again that you cover or your area? It's, so anyone who lives between Virginia and Maine on the East Coast. All right. We also had Brandon Williams attend one of our presentations. He's the DFW uh, credit union rep and we're going to try and get all the guys from all the different and women. There's a couple of women too from the different areas of the country. So uh, you'll be able to meet them all. They provide a really good service. Um, you also provide a financial plan for people. Um, do you not, John? And, and how much does that cost to get a financial planning work up from the credit union if you're a member? Sure. A financial plan, whether for retirement or any other purpose, college included, is zero dollars and zero cents. Great. Free is one of my favorite F words. I like to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> free, free is a magic number, as I would say. It's a good four letter F word. It's a good four letter <laughs> F word. It is. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. Thanks, John. OK, sure. Are you going to hang around in case we have any questions for you at the end? Yes, I will. I'll be hanging on until it's all over. If you're available, thank you very much. Yes, of course. All right. So, John was talking about income. Let's talk about income. All right. In retirement, you're going to have multiple streams of income, hopefully. Um, and I like to think of the, the five big ones as you're going to have your 401k, you're going to have your uh, IRA, you're going to have your Social Security. You're going to have savings. And savings may not be just what you think of. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And you're going to have a pension if applicable. And if you've got these five streams of income, it's kind of like having a five-legged stool. Um, it, it offers a lot of stability because even if one of those got kicked out from underneath you, it would hurt, but the other four would, would offer you some continuing stability. Kicked out. I don't know. I don't know. Let's pick on Social Security. What if? Congress were to pass a law that says, hey, you took advantage of tax deferred savings and you've got a 401k or an IRA. You don't need as much Social Security as somebody else, so we're going to give you less. They wouldn't do that. <laughs> oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Do you remember Social Security used to be uh, age 65 and now it's not? Now it depends on what year you were born. It's 66, 66 and four months, 67. For most of us, it's getting to be 67. I think that was anyone born in 1960 or later. Um, yeah, uh, they, they did that back uh, when Ronald Reagan was president and they did it in order to balance the federal budget. It was all just magic smoke and mirrors, but they uh, kind of thought that by the time we figured out how they'd screwed us, that they'd be dead. They were right but I'm still angry and unhappy about it. So yeah, so having these multiple streams of income is really good. And every time I see this list, I'm always happy that I work for a union that has always uh, sought to have as many options available for people to plan for retirement as possible. Because I contrast that with the uh, over 50% of people on social security, that that's all they got. I mean, my goodness, what kind of security is there when your entire financial life depends on the good graces of the United States Congress? Uh-uh. No, glad to be where I am. All right. Um, hey, what about my 401k loan? Well, uh, your first option is continue to pay the loan back on your current amortization schedule and pay it off or pay it off entirely. Um, because you don't have a paycheck anymore, you'll have to, you know, send them a check, put up a credit card, get an electronic debit, something like that. And that's a good option. The second option is to stop making payments, take the outstanding balances of distribution. And like we talked about, distributions are taxed as income. And if you're not yet 59 and a half, you will have that penalty as well. Uh, one last thing about uh, to remember about your 401k is that your 401k is going to freeze for the first 30 days. Uh, and I mean freeze solid. You can't make changes. You, you can't take money out. You can't add. Uh, so if you, you're going to need money during that first 30 days, you might consider rolling a little bit out of your 401k prior to exiting so you don't have to, uh, won't have to wait for the 30 day uh, to freeze to expire. I do want to point out that if you need money out of your 401k in the first 30 days of retirement, you may not quite be ready yet. Talk to your financial advisor about that. 
Uh, you'll also have the option to roll your 401k into an IRA, roll it into a new 401k, you get to go to a new employer, welcome to Walmart, welcome to Walmart, they've got a great 401k, they'd love to have you roll all that money over into their 401k so that they can make commissions on that as well. Um, you always want to compare uh, pricing on things and uh, um, the 401k in America is a pretty big one, so they've got pretty good prices on things. Uh, IRA, hey, we've got a pre-tax and a post-tax, which is exactly what John was talking about with your 401k. You've got the, the regular IRA, the regular 401k. You've got the Roth IRA, the Roth 401k. Um, however, with the IRA, there are income limits, which do not exist with your 401k. Uh, income limits are currently $68,000 for single, $109,000 for married. Had a neighbor call me in February, he's ranting and raving that they wouldn't let him make his uh, IRA contributions last year. And I said, it's because you made too much money. <laughs> Cry me a river. Okay, yeah. Um, you can do conversions. And as you get closer and closer to retirement age, you will start getting all sorts of solicitations uh, for those conversions. And uh, I'm sure most of them are, are well intended, but you know, we tend to think, ah, retire, deferred accounts, uh, IRA, 401k, pretty much the same thing. Well, they're not really. And so you want to think a lot and study a lot about the conversion before you do it. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, 401k is a product of federal law, so it's covered under ERISA. And therefore, it has some protections like um, you, they can't take it from you in a bankruptcy. They can't take it from you if you get sued. However, an IRA is a product of state law. And it depends on what state you live in, how much of your IRA balance is protected. I think it's Michigan, where you get to keep the first 50,000 of your IRA and the person that sued you gets the rest of it. So, yeah, the, also the way people inherit, your kids or whoever inherits money, is different from an IRA to a 401k. The things you can do to reduce taxes, like donate money out of it, are different from an IRA to a 401k. I'm not saying one is right or wrong. But make sure you know what you're doing before you roll your 401k to an IRA, because that's a one-way door. You can roll it into an IRA. You can't ever roll an IRA back into a 401k. All right, questions? Okay, how do I get to enjoy the 401k money if I can't take it out? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can sit and stare at the screen and be admi no. Uh, you can you can uh, you can take it out as you need it. Um, it's just like, gee, if I wasn't getting a paycheck, I wouldn't have to pay all these taxes. Uh, yeah, but you also wouldn't be able to to enjoy life, you know, live life, have food, housing. So uh, you'll have to take it out and pay taxes on it, just like you have to pay taxes on on your paycheck. Uh, I have 12 years company time and I'm 51 years old. I recently moved into the flight attendant position. Am I eligible to retire under the 65 point plan next year when my years of service is 13, my age is 52, bringing me to the magic 65? I think if you have 12 years of company seniority and your age plus your years of service equals 65 or more, you would be eligible. Um, and I think your company seniority carries over if, if you were in another department, although things like bidding seniority and, you know, pay seniority and stuff like that will change if you transfer from another department. Now, I remember in a previous presentation, you mentioned there's someone that you can contact to verify you're at the 65 point plan. How that would be about doing that? retirement services department, and uh, you would get to them by calling the team member services number, which is 1-800-447-2000. And then you hit option one for active employees. And the next menu, you hit option three for retirement and pension questions. And you should be able to get connected with a live human being who can confirm whether or not you're eligible for the 65 point plan. And if not, when you will be eligible for the 65 point plan. And I would add a pro tip if you're that close, like it's, you know, is it this month or next month that I'm going to, 
Uh, make sure you also do something in writing like an email confirmation. And when you turn it, so you have something in writing that they said, yeah, you were eligible. And when you turn in your notice, send it to your flight service manager in, in email and say, if I am eligible for the 65 point plan, I am retiring on such and such a date. And that way, if they retire you and then two weeks later come back and say, oh, yeah, you weren't retired, you weren't eligible, so you don't get anything. You say, no, no. I said, if I was eligible, I retire. If I wasn't eligible, I didn't retire. So that's just one of those pro tips. Great. I also dropped in that phone number with the um, path into the chat. So any of this information, by the way, feel free to take a screenshot of um, any of these slides or any of the information that I've dropped in the chat. OK, um, we are good to continue. All right. Hi, Kim, what can you tell us about Social Security? OK, I always get to talk about all the boring things like <laughs> Social Security and Medicare, something I never thought I would be talking about. I mm -hmm. was sitting around listening to my grandparents talk about all their aches and pains and their Social Security and telling people to get off their lawn. and. You know, now if you look at our demographics of our work group, there's a lot of people that need to start thinking about when they're going to start Social Security, surprisingly. And I'm getting close to being one of them. Yikes. So anyway, um, Social Security may be taken as early as age 62, as late as age 70. There is no increase to your uh, Social Security after age 70. So after age 70, you shouldn't wait. Take it, you know. So... Um, the website for Social Security is www.ssa.gov. That's where you can go to find out your Social Security estimate for what you're going to make if, if you take it early at age 62, if you take it late at age 70, or if you take it at your full Social Security age, which for anybody born after 1960 is age 67. So um, they, they used to send out paper uh, you know, little printouts every year of how much your Social Security was going to be at each of those ages. Now it's all available online at www.ssa.gov. All right, married couples have some very complicated decisions to make uh, when filing for Social Security. Um, if you're a single person, you have uh, nine different options. Uh, multiply that. And if you're married, you have 81 different options for taking your Social Security. So um, talk to a Social Security advisor. We are not Social Security advisors. They're out there in every state, and we recommend you talk to them. They'll help you figure out the best plan for you. Also, some financial advisors um, have some input about how to coordinate your Social Security with all of your other income, 401k investments, and so on. OK, so if you're a geek like Patrick, other than Social Security advisors, there are apps. Put an app on your phone and there's an app for that. it will show you how to maximize your Social Security benefits. So um, if you're old school like me, you'll call an advisor. If you're geeky like Patrick, you'll use the app or do both. All right, so uh, early Social Security at age 62. There are some pros and cons if you're considering taking your Social Security early that you may want to think about. Um, if a pro is that you're going to get more years of payments if you start it early. Um, another pro, you can get the money now if you need it now. A con is that you'll have lower payments for the rest of your life. Um, you'll be subject to income limits until you hit your full Social Security retirement age, which we refer to as SSNRA, Social Security Normal Retirement Age. Um, so your income limit is $19,560. After that, if you're taking, you know, your early Social Security, you can only make, uh, well, you could, if you make more than 19560 in 2022, you will deduct $1 of benefits for every $2 earned over this limit. So it's something to think about. Wait, 19560 is going to be less than if I'm just flying 40 hours. Yes, it is. So if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to fly my hard 40, maybe you want to wait and not start your Social Security until after you actually retire. Because so, um, you will be subject to those income limits. 
uh, break even point on Social Security, the average age of death. And this begs the question, when am I going to die? So when should I start Social Security? Well, here's a little chart that illustrates. So if you look at the blue line, somebody starting at age 62, and the red line, somebody starting at their full Social Security age, where do the lines cross? The average age of death, age, what, 72 and a half or 79 and a half or something like that? Yep. So if you're like my grandmother who drove her car until she was in her 90s, she lived a long time, it, it would have made more sense for her to start her Social Security at the full Social Security age. But if you're like some of Patrick's relatives who, you know, maybe died before they could find out if they were going to lose their hair, well, starting early would be a good idea because you're going to get more years of payments up front. So um, that's one of the hardest things because you're sort of taking a guess at how long you're going to live. And none of us really have that answer. Um, anyway, when you want to talk about this, the income limits. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes people say, well, hey, man, that's kind of weird because, you know, wh what if I retire um, like at age 66, my full A, but I, it's the middle of the year that I turn full A, a full uh, SSNRA? Well, there's a special deal uh, because that that's quite common that you don't turn 66 or the full retirement age on January 1st. So in that year that you turn full retirement age, your cap on earnings is uh, 51,960. So if you're, uh, if you're born early in the year, that's not an issue. If you're born late in the year, like uh, I'm a November baby, uh, you, you have to think about that because you may have already earned 51,960. So uh, you'll have to balance out do I want the income and uh, start Social Security later? Yeah. Okay. So you'll need to uh, work that out, and it's just pure math. Well, one of the questions we get all the time is, well, what, what, do you, what do you mean earnings? What counts as earnings for Social Security? And earnings is income from wages, so anything you earn for flying, or net earnings from self-employment. You got a little job out there, you know, you're you're uh, uh, helping people with landscaping. That's all going to count toward that maximum. Uh, that includes bonuses, commissions, severance pay. That all counts toward that maximum. Or if you're not even in that year, that nineteen thousand five hundred. However, here's real, what's really important: is what doesn't count. Earnings do not include investment income, pensions, pensions. Yeah, yeah you can start your pension. It won't hurt you for Social Security, early Social Security. Uh, it's not dividends, capital gains. So you've got a bunch of you know. Uh, Tesla stock out there and it's spinning off di dividends and capital gains, that will not negatively affect your Social Security benefits uh, for early early ret uh, retire ret uh, drawing on your Social Security. But if we get the question, hey, is, is Social Security taxable? Well, yes and no. <laughs> um, the first 15% of your Social Security is tax-free. So we're talking about how much of your Social Security is taxed, not the tax rate. So the first 15% is always tax-free. Uh, Bill Gates doesn't pay income tax on the first 15% of his Social Security. He doesn't know or care. Um, mm -hmm. You may pay tax on 0, 50, or 85% of the rest, depending on your combined income. Notice, again, this is how much of it is subject to tax, not the tax rate. So if you're making over 44000 uh, jointly as a couple, 85% of your Social Security is going to be taxed. So, uh, and that's under the federal government. What about my state taxes? Well, in 37 states, your Social Security is tax-free. Um, in 13 states, do tax some or all of your Social Security, and those uh, bad boy 13 are here, Colorado, Colorado, West Virginia. So, you know, if you're thinking about moving your home from, you know, Florida or Texas to your lovely little cabin in West Virginia or Utah, you might want to think about that because that may impact your taxes on your Social Security. Savings. Well, savings has some interesting approach. In addition to the cash, stocks, bonds, you may have some hidden savings. Home equity. Um, and uh, I, I really don't like uh, reverse mortgages. So you want to think about ways, uh, maybe sell your home and downsize uh, into a smaller place, get some of that home equity out. Um, you know, I, I say reverse mortgages. I really discourage people from using them. But hey, if you need the money and it's there, uh, maybe you'll just want to do that just because you need it.
Also, life insurance may have some cash value. And I'm not talking about what the payout if your spouse mysteriously dies and you have a good alibi. Uh, there may be some, some you know, cash value that you can borrow against it or take some money out in advance. But not the life insurance that we get from the company. Not the life. No, no. The life insurance we have while we're an active employee is term. If you don't die during the term, it has no value. Kim, what can you tell us about pensions? Okay, pensions. Well, where, when you start your pension and, and how old and everything is going to be dependent on where you started out your career as a flight attendant. So we're all American Airlines, but a lot of us started our careers at a bunch of different places. So you're going to have one set of rules if you're a legacy AA flight attendant and another set of rules if you're a legacy U.S. Airways flight attendant, just to make it complicated. So if you're a U legacy U.S. Airways flight attendant, Guess what? You, you could have started your career any number of places and your pension is going to vary. The pension commencing rules are going to vary depending on where you started out. So basically, here's a little chart that illustrates everything. If you're a shuttle flight attendant, uh, your early pension age is age 52. Your full pension age is age 62. There is a 3% per year max reduction for every year to start your pension prior to the full pension age of 62. So for instance, you started at 52, um, there will be a 30% reduction in the full value of your pension. This is basically because all these actuaries at the PBGC and the AA pension plan, they think they know how long we're all going to live. So they've calculated the value of our pensions. If you decide to take it early, they're stretching that same pile of money over several more years. So that's why they, it reduces it a little bit if you started early. If you started your career at Piedmont, Allegheny, or U.S. Airways, the early pension age is age 55, and the full pension age is age 62. PSA people, the early pension age is 55. The full pension age is not until 65. So wait a little bit longer. That reduction applies for a couple more years if you take it early. All right, the legacy AA pensions, the early pension age is 55. You'll see the same 3% reduction per, per year prior to the full pension age of age 60. So if you start your pension at 55, there will be a 15% reduction in the full value of your pension. And we're going to talk about double dipping in a minute. This only applies to the legacy U.S. Airways pension. There is no double dipping for the legacy AA pensions. So double dipping, um, it used to be back in the day that once you reached your full pension age and you were still working, you could start your pension while you're still working for the company, as long as it was a PBGC pension. So the rule, uh, the restriction on waiting until your full pension age to double dip went away last year on 6-1-2021. So now PBGC pension holders, once they have reached their and early pension age can start double dipping, and many of them are. So um, if you are your, the er, you've you reached the early pension age and you want to start double dipping while you're still working, you would contact the PBGC. The early reductions do still apply, and there's no reduction at the full pension age. All right, pension options. Patrick. How many different ways can I get my money? Well, funny, you should ask how many different ways I can get your money. There are three basic ways you can get your pension money. The first is a single life annuity. The PBGC calls that a straight life annuity, but you'll notice the uh, acronym SLA is the same. Uh, and of course, being an airline, we run on caffeine, jet fuel, and acronyms. Uh, the second way is you can share with someone else, and I do remind you, it is nice to share. And the third way is a minimum number of checks. So we'll look at these three options. There's a fourth option if you're legacy AA, and that is uh, more upfront, less later. We call that the level income option. The single life annuity, you get a check every month until you're dead, and then it stops. And uh, that is uh, the normal form of benefit. Uh, a payment every month is an annuity. We've got a lot of annuities in our life. Your mortgage is an annuity, but this is money coming into you. They pay that annuity to you for your lifetime, so it's a life annuity. It's for one life, yours, so that's where they come up with single life annuity or a straight life annuity. And the single life annuity is the normal form of benefit. Um, well, what do I mean by normal? Well, 
Um, a couple of things. First off, remember when we were trying to do that planning, we had to figure out the goal, how long we want to live, how much we want to do. When the company is funding a pension, they have to do a lot of those same questions, and they start that the first day you start working. So one of the questions they have to ask is, how are you going to take your pension 40 years from now? And the assumption is that you are going to take a single life annuity. And so they, they fund for that. And what, so now they have the value of the single life annuity, and that determines the, value, the payment on all those other options. Well, what about those other options? Well, let's talk about it's nice to share. Uh, a pension for your life and someone else's life as well. They'll get an annuity for their life after you're gone. You never get two checks to the same household. When you die, your survivor starts getting it, and therefore the check, and therefore we call it the survivor annuity. And uh, they're going to get, uh, it's still the same big pile of money, so you can choose to leave them 50 to 100% of what you're getting, not your single life annuity, but your share of the joint annuity. But here's the problem. The more you leave them, the less you get. Well, dang. So I'm going to get less while I'm alive so they can get a benefit. Well, I guess I have to do that because otherwise Bozo's going to be living under a bridge. All right, well, I'm just going to suck it up and do it. So I do it. But what happens if they die first? Crap. I'm stuck at the lower monthly amount. I could have had a higher amount with the single life annuity, but because I was protecting Bozo, uh, I screwed. There's a technical name for that, and that is you're screwed. However, there is a way to cover that risk, and that is flight attendants have the option called a pop-up annuity. And the pop-up annuity says by taking a slightly lower amount each month, you can cover the risk that the joint annuitant dies first. If you do the pop-up and your joint annuitant dies first, you pop back up to the single life annuity amount as though you'd never made that. So for the rest of your life, you get that full single life annuity. And most people are going to take one of these two options. And by most people, I mean like north of 95%. There is another option out there, <clears throat> and that's the uh, guaranteed period certain. And checks come for a minimum of 10, 15, or 20 years at LAA or 5, 10, or 15 years at LUS. Um, it's very rare that you would do this because you're going to get less for guaranteeing that check for those number of years. The, weir the one weird thing where that, that might make sense is that if you're pretty sure you're gonna die soon, um, you may want to take the period certain so that you can have a beneficiary who would not get very much as a joint survivor annuity, but would get the, uh, the larger amount by taking the checks for the minimum number of periods. Again, it's very rare, but it's really nice to know it's out there if you need it. And if you're a legacy AA, there's a fourth option, and that is uh, more upfront, less later. Most of that comes from people that uh, ended up uh, taking the sudden out. Uh, they'll be fine once Social Security kicks in, but right now Social Security hasn't kicked in. American says, we got a deal for you. We'll give you more now until you reach one of your Social Security ages, either 62 or whatever your SSNRA is. And then once you reach that age, we're going to reduce your pension. Um, I don't know that it's actuarially sound. They swear up and down it is. Um, it's not, I don't think it's a great option, but if you need the money now, you need the money now. So it's nice to know that that is out there. So how do I apply for my pension? No earlier than 90 days before you start your pension. Oh, I need more lead time than that. Sorry. No earlier than 90 days before you start your pension. Uh, at LAA, you request a, your paperwork, which uh, we call a kit, uh, by calling that pension service center, the number that Josh put into the chat. Uh, or you can go on to JetNet. Uh, remember where you uh, pulled up your pension estimate? One of the you had pages you had a choice between get my pension or get my pension estimate. If you click the Get My Pension, that go ahead and starts the uh, process to send you the kit. Uh, if you're an LUS, you want to contact the PBG direct, directly at 800-400-7242 or go to the pbgc.gov website. Are there taxes on pensions? Oh, yeah, you bet. So you pay federal income taxes on pension as ordinary income, just like you were burn, uh, earning it. And that's 10 to 37% rate, depending on your total household income. Uh, you'll notice that uh, if you make between um, 19,000 and 80,000, you're in the 12% bracket. Once you get above 80,000, 
everything above the 80,000, not the amount below, but the amount above, the additional income is taxed at 22. That's a pretty big step. And then you get some little steps uh, up to one uh, at 171 household income, you're not 24. Uh, if you're uh, making uh, 622,000 or more, you're not a flight attendant. Oh, and your uh, tax rate is at 37%, which isn't very far from being at the 24% uh, level. Some states don't tax pension. There are 14 states or only tax a portion of them, four states. So remember, your mileage may vary. vary. This is used for some mythical flight attendant and not for you. Kim, what can you give us on pension tips? Okay, pension tips. Uh, your pension kits can be ordered from AA or the PBGC no more than 90 days from retirement, as Patrick mentioned. Pensions always start on the first of the calendar month, so you need to be done with your last trip before the end of the month. If you're still flying when you're supposed to be retiring, that's going to delay the start of your pension. I think that maybe PBS, once it's coded, won't let you hold a trip or will bump you off the trip, but always good to be cautious anyway. There's glitches that we know about with PBS. So um, fly-through trips, obviously, that couldn't be dropped for some reason uh, will delay the start of your pension. So make sure you know, all your trips are off the end of the month when you're retiring. All right, have copies of all divorce decrees and quadros. This is a big surprise for a lot of people when they get their pension paperwork. They're going, wait, I was divorced. I was married to that guy for two months back at the start of my career when we had a Vegas layover and I don't even know where the paperwork is. Well, guess what? You're gonna have to find it. If the marriage and divorce took place, while you were working for AA or US Airways, whatever company that pension comes from, they will want a copy of the divorce paperwork in with your pension kit. So be prepared to call the county and have them send it to you if that's what it takes. Um, if you're a widow or a widower, they will want a copy of the death certificate with your kit. The first month is always paid retroactively. So normally it takes about six to eight weeks following retirement to get your first pension payment. So say you retire on August 1st, you'll probably get the first pension check sometime in September, maybe even October, but you'd be retro paid to August 1st. So you get August and September, possibly August, September and October, all in the first um, check. So. When you're paid out for that big check for your vacation, that will sometimes tide you over until you get your first pension check. All right, qualified pre-retirement survivor annuity. This is a benefit to the AA flight attendants, only the legacy AA flight attendants with legacy AA pensions. Um, the federal law says that your spouse automatically gets a 50% joint and survivor annuity if you pass away. And this is if you pass away prior to your pension commencing. And even if you're signing up for your pension, if your spouse doesn't sign off on it, they're entitled to a 50% joint and survivor annuity. Um, this form would allow you to leave 100% of your pension to your spouse if you were to pass away prior to commencing your pension benefits. So um, the form can be found on JetNet. It's in uh, team member services, then Leaving American, then uh, Pension Service Center, Read More, and then it will have online pension forms there. So that's where you can find it on JetNet, or we have a copy of it on the APFA website as well, or I can email one to you if you like. So for anyone who is married and they're an AA flight attendant, if something were to happen to you and you want your spouse to get 100% of your pension if you pass away, you should have that form on file with the company. Um, flight attendants are the only work group on property that can do this and the company pays. It was a negotiated benefit for the AA flight attendants. Um, if you talk to a pilot, they'll say, oh, don't fill out that form, it'll reduce your pension, but it will not reduce our pension and it's a good thing to have on file if you're married. Um, it must, you must have been married at least one year, so unfortunately, no, you know, last minute, oh, I'm going to retire 
put this person down. No, you get married really quick, quick because I'm sick. No, unfortunately, you have to have been married at least 12 months. So plan accordingly. Plan accordingly. <laughs> Weekend at Bernie's. Okay, we're at another question stop. Any questions? All right, yeah, we've got quite a few for this portion, or a couple for this portion, rather. Um, I retired this year at 20, uh, this year, 2022, at 52 years of age. Congratulations on your retirement. The pension department says that I'm not eligible for pension commencement until age 55. Therefore, they cannot send me any paperwork until at least 90 days prior to 55. Is this correct? Yes, it is. However, I think you're asking for paperwork so you can do some planning. And I've got great news for you. Uh, you can get all of that information by just uh, getting a pension estimate. Uh, and I'm assuming you're L LAA because you called the pension department. You can go on to the uh, retiree website. website and get a pension estimate. And that pension estimate, because it's frozen and because they finally got the formulas working, is probably accurate within about a buck. So uh, you can use that to do your retirement planning. Okay, great. You can go to the um, retirement website, you know, retirees website, or you get you can ask the pension service center to send you an estimate. You know, so say you're going to start it at age 55. There's a three percent reduction per year if it's LAA. That would be a 15 percent reduction. So what a lot of people do is say, send me a pension estimate for age 55 and then side by side one for age 60 so they can see the difference between taking their pension early and waiting for the full pension age and then you get to decide which one, which option is gonna be best for you. If I retire at age 66, how much and how soon will I get my pension? So like we said, if you retire at age 66, you know, whenever you retire in that year, it's gonna take six to eight weeks for them to get you your first pension check. And this is pretty, almost with AA and the PBGC, it's yeah. pretty uh, standard. Are we earning interest on our pensions? If not, why? Uh, no, you're not earning interest on your pension because your pension isn't a pile of money with your name on it. Your pension is a promise to pay you a certain amount. We're gonna pay you $1,500 a month for the rest of your life. And so somewhere there's a pile of money to back up that promise, but it doesn't matter whether that pile of money is earning interest or not, you're still gonna get your $1,500. So it's not like a 401k where I have my own account and it's vested in its own, it's invested in its own you know, whatever. Correct, account. correct. There's one big pile of money to pay out all of those promises. And if that pile of money is not enough, American, the employer is on the hook for the rest of it. So it's an annuity. That means you're gonna get a certain amount every month and the company basically purchased the annuities, you know. There is a fund earning interest, hopefully, <laughs> that's gonna back up all those annuities, but uh, that's kind of how it works. Our last question, until uh, we continue on, how do I know if uh, Quipsa is on file? I can't remember if I did this. I, maybe that was Quadro, it's QPRSA. That, that's <laughs> that's <enough>. probably. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a merge between so, the two. So you, so you can call retirement services or you can go online to the pension service center. Again, you get to that by logging on to JetNet, then clicking on um, team member services, then leaving American and a page will open up and it will say pension service center. You wanna click read more under that. Then your personal pension service center page will open up and your name will be up in the left-hand corner above your name it's going to say my pension so you click on that and then when you the next page opens it says uh, estimate my pension or request my pension when you click on estimate my pension it gives you the option to view your plan specific data and if you do that there's a little chart and in that little chart it will show if you have a quipsa on file or not so you can go find that information in the pension service center or you can call uh, the Pension Service Center through team member services and ask them if you have a Quipsa on file. So that was a lot of navigating that you Yes. Do you mind if I share my screen and show them how to find that? Go for it. I'm a very visual person. Now, are you gonna, you don't have, do you have a legacy AA pension? No, but we can at least show them the first Very couple good. of clicks. Okay. And then they can follow along from there. Oh, 
Okay. So, so I'm going to go to team member team services. services. And then leading then American. Leading above. American. Okay. And then pension service center. Under that, you click read more. If you click plan information, you'll get the whole boring plan document. And if you want to read that, great, but that's not where you go to find this information. Uh, and it. And then if I've had. If, if you, you have had, a pension, it will come up and it will say pension service center and your name will be in the left hand upper corner and you can go from there. Okay, great. Thank you for that. We are ready to continue. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the third basket. Mm -hmm. We've talked about your retirement, you know, income. We've talked about your retirement benefits, such as your travel benefit. Now we're going to talk about uh, the limited amount of <laughs> retirement medical insurance options and what your alternatives are. So um, your options are COBRA. And if you look at the dollar signs, COBRA is pretty expensive. Um, the AA retiree medical insurance we refer to, that's even more expensive than COBRA. What's going on with that? The Affordable Care Act, it depends on what state you live in. It could be relatively inexpensive to kind of comparable to the COBRA, depending on where you live. Medicare, if you're up for that and then the right age or eligible for some other reason, that probably will be your best and only option when you retire. The old fashioned way, you can marry someone with insurance or go on your spouse's insurance or die young, but this really isn't an option. Nobody wants to do that. That sucks. All right, COBRA. COBRA allows you to continue the health insurance coverage that you had as an active employee. You don't have to reestablish your deductible or your out-of-pocket max. That's the good thing about it. Um, the bad thing, the participant pays the full cost plus a 2% admin fee. So when we're working for the company, guess what? Our insurance seems expensive, but we're paying 20% and the company is subsidizing the other 80%. So when you switch to COBRA, you're paying the full cost for that coverage. And it seems like a big ouch when you have to start doing that. Um, the coverage can last for up to 18 months, um, could last for up to 29 months if you're eligible for Social Security disability. Um, so that's other possibility. Um, it must be taken within the first 60 days of leaving the company. It's a one shot deal. So if you miss that 60 day window, um, you're not going to be offered it again. COBRA can include medical, dental, vision, and flexible spending, and you can mix and match the coverage. So you could just continue your dental and vision, which a lot of people who are eligible for Medicare choose to do, and not continue the medical part. Once the coverage begins, it's retroactive to the date you leave American Airlines. Now, this is an, an annoying for a lot of people because we've got a lot of type A flight attendants and they want to be on the ball and they want to sign up for everything early. But guess what? For COBRA, there's a trigger. And the trigger for you being offered COBRA in this situation is your retirement. So you're not going to be offered that COBRA until you retire because it's your retirement that makes you eligible for the COBRA. So there's going to be a little bit of an administrative delay, um, but once you sign up for the COBRA coverage, it's retro to the date you left the company. So it will be once you sign up for it as though you never lost your coverage, but there is a little bit of an admin lag time in there. Um, your payments, it's important to make your payments on time or they will drop you from the coverage. This is very important with COBRA. A lot of people set up a direct debit so they don't have to worry about being late for their payments. Oh, and another thing, if you're eligible for Medicare, COBRA is not considered creditable coverage as an alternative to Medicare. So if you're eligible for Medicare, you need to sign up for Medicare. Um, COBRA is secondary to Medicare always. Oops, and even if you don't sign up for Medicare, um, the company is gonna you know, 
act like COBRA is secondary to Medicare and they're only going to pay as a secondary. So if you're eligible for Medicare, I can't stress it enough, you really need to sign up for Medicare. All right, retiree medical insurance. Um, this is a really expensive insurance that used to be uh, free when we retired because we were pre-funding for that, but it went away as a result of bankruptcy. Um, we still have the option to purchase it. You have to be between 55 and 65 and eligible for the 65 point plan when you retire and not yet eligible for Medicare. The participant pays the full cost for this coverage. The price is uncapped and it can vary a lot from year to year, which is why a lot of retirees on a fixed income don't like that. It's the pricing is unstable. So how much does it cost? Here's an example. Um, it's really good coverage, uh, $150 deductible, $1,000 out-of-pocket max for a single person. That's great. You don't see that a lot these days. However, for 2022 per person, for well, for a single person per month, $1,826. So that's close to $2,000 a month for one person. Yikes. This is why we're always looking for better options. Now that you've seen the cost, what are some of our other alternatives? Well, the Affordable Care Act. Go to www.healthcare.gov, put in your zip code, and it will show what options are available to you in your state. If your income is low enough when you retire, you may be eligible for tax credits, so you may get a subsidy under the Affordable Care Act. Um, another place you can look for coverage is through VIA Benefits. It's a company that AA contracts with. They will assist pre-65 retirees to find plans under the Affordable Care Act. And if you're Medicare eligible and you're confused about what Medicare plans to choose, if you're post-65, they'll help you find Medicare plans. So um, we've got the two numbers, one for pre-65, one for post-65 and the website, which is my.viabenefits.com slash American Airlines. This is also in our retiree um, packet, the good slide handout. So, all right, Medicare. Um, employees and spouses over the age of 65. Uh, uh, this is if you're still working and you, you turn 65. We get questions about this all the time. Do I have to go on Medicare? I'm still working. And, you, you know, my everybody says I'm going to be penalized if I don't sign up for Medicare right away, right away, even Part A. And the answer to that is no. If you're still working for the company when you turn 65, the AA coverage is considered to be creditable coverage. You don't have to sign up for Medicare, not even Part A. Um, part A is the hospitalization part of Medicare, and it is free basically because you've been paying a little bit out of your paycheck for all these years to cover it. So most people go ahead and sign up for Medicare Part A, even if they're gonna work beyond the age of 65, just because there's no cost associated with it. And when they do retire and go on Medicare, they're already in the system. So it makes it a little easier. The only time that you would not wanna sign up for Medicare Part A is if you're on the core plan um, that is the high deductible insurance plan, and there's a health account associated with that that you can take into Medicare. And if you sign up for Part A early, it will mess that up. So you don't want to do that. The only time not to sign up for Part A is if, if you're under the core plan, which is the high deductible plan. All right, so Medicare is comprised of Part A, which I mentioned before is the hospitalization portion. They like to make things complicated. We have one insurance when we're working. When we get out, they divide it up into all these little buckets. So Part A is your hospitalization. Part B is your labs and regular doctor's visits and specialist visits. And Part D for drug, that's your prescription drug coverage. Um, if you don't, if you retire and you don't sign up on time, there are late enrollment fees. So um, when you retire, if you're past the age of 65, you're entitled to what's called a special enrollment period for Medicare. And in order to be show Medicare that you're eligible for that special enrollment period, you would have to provide verification. There's a form called the Medicare Employer Verification form, uh, 
fondly known of as the CMS L564. You get that form, you fax it to the company, and they're going to mail it back to you showing that you've had coverage with them since you turned 65. That's going to entitle you to the special enrollment period under Medicare, and you're not going to be assessed any late enrollment penalties because you showed you had good coverage up until your retirement. Um, here's a copy of the form, and you can get it on Medicare.gov, or I think you can get it on JetNet as well. Yeah. All right, more about Medicare. Um, and in addition to Medicare A, B, and D, you're going to want to sign up for a Medigap policy, which is also known as a Medicare supplement plan, because your regular Medicare Part B does not have a, a um, has a deductible, but it doesn't have an out-of-pocket max. So if you have something catastrophic happen and your 20% gets really big, you want to have an out-of-pocket max. So you don't have to spend too much. It limits how much is going to come out of your pocket. So there are 10 different Medigap or Medicare supplement plans available. AA retirees have an 11th option, which is a Medigap VIVA plan. It was a trust that was set up specifically for retired airline workers. Um, there are also Part C and Medicare Advantage plans. These are set up more along the lines of an HMO. So if you live in a big metropolitan area, you see ads all the time for you know, different Medicare Advantage plans. They often have a few little perks like health club memberships and so on. And also, My silver sneakers. Yes, your silver sneakers membership. Um, but make sure that whichever plan you choose is the right one for you. If you're out in the country, Medicare Advantage plan, plans may not have good coverage in your area. Um, if you're in a big metropolitan area, you're probably fine going with one of those. Some cover, uh, you know, when you're traveling out of the country, some don't. So really talk to a Medicare advisor and they will help you determine which is the best plan for you. Yeah, contact that Medicare advisor because we can give you some general information, but beyond that, uh, we're not we're not really qualified to advise people. Um, go to www.medicare.gov, and if you go to your state, you can find a list of free Medicare advisors, the VIA benefits that the company works for, I mean, contracts with, and we also have the name of a few Medicare advisors that other flight attendants have uh, recommended. So if you want those, uh, just give us a call. All right, so we've covered a lot of important questions. What do you need to retire? What do you get in retirement? What about income? So here's the final little details that you need to research. You need to know about life events, optional insurance, dental insurance, the flex spending accounts, how does that work when I retire? So life events. The important thing to remember is that your retirement, in particular, if you're going on your spouse's uh, insurance, is your spouse or your partner's life event. So when you retire, they have 30 days, sometimes 60 days, to file the life event and add you to their coverage. Another thing to remember, if you're married to another AA employee and you're going on their coverage, when you switch over, you're going to lose your deductible and out-of-pocket for the year. So um, they're going to look at it as a new plan and new coverage. So it's all going to reset. So either go on their coverage, retire at the end of the year, go on their coverage at the beginning of the year. Some people do the COBRA for a few months and go on their spouse's coverage at the end of the year if they've met their deductible and out-of-pocket max. All right, optional insurance. This is um, includes MetLife Legal, long-term care, home and auto policies, pet insurance. So all of these coverages can be continued beyond retirement. You just have to contact the administrator of those plans. So MetLife or um, who does the pet insurance, I don't even know, but it's all on the AA added benefits um, site on uh, JetNet in the employee section. So I'm mean, sorry, in the benefits section. So those are all under AA added benefits. And if you call them, they can put you in touch with the administrators of the various plans and tell you how to continue those. You're basically just going to be setting up a direct bill to continue those coverages. 
All right, your employee life insurance and your employee accident insurance will end, but it may be ported or converted into a private policy within 30 to 60 days post retirement. So it doesn't, the good thing about porting or converting your life insurance is that it's, you don't have to take a physical or answer any health questions. It's just continuing the same coverage. However, it can be kind of expensive. Um, the part you port, I think that would be if you purchased insurance over and above what the company offers and you can continue that, that's a little less expensive than converting the company group insurance into an individual plan. But you would have to contact MetLife for information about that and they can provide you with some numbers and give you an idea of how, how much it's going to cost. If you want to continue your AD&D or voluntary personal accident insurance, you contact Lina. Um, also, you can get this information from the AA benefits um, section of JetNet. All right, your long-term and short-term disability coverage will end. However, if you're receiving payments from MetLife for long-term or short-term disability, that means you filed a claim prior to your retirement and that claim will be paid out until the end of that claim. So you can still potentially receive benefits from MetLife long or short-term disability beyond your retirement if you're still disabled and the claim is still active. All right, dental insurance, ah, it's scary. Nobody seems to wanna to take care of retirees' teeth. All right, so MetLife does have dental insurance. They're going to offer you retiree dental insurance. Most people don't take it. It's pretty high dollar, low benefit. You're probably going to be paying as much in a year for this coverage as the level of the benefit that you get. So it's not really worth it. There are some other options. So the credit union has a dental club through Benefit Services of America. A lot of people sign up for that. It's not really insurance, it's a club you can join. And if you go to one of their providers, you get discounted services. Um, Costco has something similar. A lot of people sign up for that. There are dental schools. You can be a guinea pig, get your teeth done by a student with supervision, of course. And once the bleeding stops, your teeth will look great. Anyway, we, we do actually have people that have exercised this option and said it worked well for them. That's why we throw it out there. Also, some Medicare supplement plans, the government's getting with it that we need to take care of our teeth and it's part of our overall health. So they're starting to offer a few more options um, in conjunction with Medicare. Some of the Medigap and Advantage plans have a little extra dental insurance you can purchase. So if you are talking to a Medicare advisor, ask them about that. All right, flex spending. Um, when you retire, you're going to be able to take advantage of your flex spending if you use it all before you leave. So normally in a calendar year, you if you're contributing to a flexible spending account, you have to use it all. Up, I guess as long as you have $500 left, it would roll over to the next year if you're active. But if you have more than that left, you're going to lose it. When you retire, if you use everything at the beginning, you know, say in the first three months of the year, and you haven't paid all the deposits for the rest of the year, you have the ability to use it all, then retire, and then the company has to eat the rest of the deposits you would have made during that calendar year. So if you have a flex spending account, we always recommend that you use the full amount that you've deposited in that account prior to your retirement. All right, now it's your turn to decide. Are you ready to retire? You know, there are a lot of moving pieces, as you can tell, but it really isn't anything you can't handle. Uh, what else you need to do before you leave? Start a list. Uh, a great checklist starts on page 37 of our handbook. Good slide. How do you do a list? Every year you go to CQ, you follow a list. How do you do it? In order, one, one step, step at, at a time. time. Yep. So <laughs> start yourself a plane departure checklist. It will work wonders for giving you comfort that you're not missing anything. And more importantly, don't be afraid to ask questions. You have never retired before. So yeah, don't, don't, don't think like you're expected to know all this stuff. Uh, they don't really train us to retire. It's one of those weird things where they just kind of say, swim, go. But I have great confidence that you are going to do it. 
because you are prepared. You've got this. You're ready. Let's go. Good slide. Questions? Awesome. Let's go to our remaining questions. Um, can I receive my pension as lump sum instead of monthly payout upon retirement? No, because remember, we talked it's not a, a pile of money with your name on it. It's an annuity. It's a promise to pay. And uh, so, no. However, there is one little, if you have an incredibly small pension, say you're going to get $12 a month, it's annoying and expensive to send you a check for $12 every month. And to avoid that, uh, the company says, hey, tell you what, can we bribe you to just go away and not, take, not make us write you a check every month? Um, and well, so they have to pay PBGC insurance on that $12 a month. So if you've got a really, really, really small pension, uh, you can get paid out as a lump sum. But that doesn't apply to very many people. In, and in if you qualify for that, the company will contact you and offer you that option. You can't just request it. <laughs> um, back to the question we received earlier. If I retire at 62, what health insurance can I get till I'm 65? So uh, we kind of covered some of that in the last section. You can get that really, really expensive uh, retiree health insurance. Most people end up going on their spouse's insurance or domestic partner if they live in a state or their spouse has a company that provides domestic partner insurance, or they go on and find something on the Affordable Care Act. That's the most that's the most popular option, you know. So uh, other than that, there aren't a whole lot of good options, unfortunately. So it's if you're going to go early, it's really something that you have to think about. All right, COBRA. Once COBRA ends, I know we need to find our own medical insurance. How would we find an insurance broker? All right. So uh, the VIA benefits people or go on your Affordable Care Act website. Um, um, what is it? www.healthcare.gov. Uh, this next question concerns the transition from AA Medical to Medicare. I have a medical Medicare account and enrolled in Part A only. And I live in uh, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. If all goes well, I expect to retire a few months after the annual Medicare open enrollment ends. Will it be possible to overlap AA Medical and the remaining Medicare Parts B, C, D, et cetera? I prefer not to be enrolled in COBRA, and I don't mind paying for both AA and Medicare. Can I take that? Yeah, you can take that. No, uh, you don't want to overlap and enroll. Um, I don't even know that it's possible, but if you could, you shouldn't. Um, what you do need to know, though, is that your retirement is a life event. And so even in Medicare, that opens a special enrollment window. So say you retire on June, you're going to retire on June 1st, you get a special enrollment window, even though it's not Medicare open enrollment, you get a special enrollment period to enroll in Medicare. You can do it up to 60 days in advance and 90 days after um, you have this, this window to enroll. So you don't have to double pay and you don't want to because it gets really messy when they each say, no, you pay, no, you pay. Okay. Um, next Medicare question, and this is our final question unless we receive any more in the live chat. Um, Medicare A, B, and C, how do you avoid an initial 500 estimate initial bill? In other words, how is the correct way to sign up for A, B, and C if needed or sign up for? I understand this paperwork has an exact timeline and procedure, otherwise you get an unexpected individual bill to pay. So it's A, B, and D because um, that's a prescription, that's the basic Medicare. And C is what we we're calling the Medicare Advantage plan. So that would be one of your kind of supplement type plans or the Medigap plan. But in order to sign up for it, there's two things. If you're leaving the company, you need to get that form that we, and you're already 65, get that form, um, employment verification form, which is on actually Medicare.gov, the Social Security website, also JetNet, you can get it any of those places, or I can email it to you. Um, there's a second form, which is the application for Medicare Part B. 
So the, those are the two forms you need to sign up. And you sign up through Social Security. That's where you go to get your Medicare started up initially. And it's best to start the process, like if you're already 65 when you retire, send in that form, probably get it and send it in about 60 days before you retire. That's the best time to do it. Because what Medicare wants to know when you're signing up is, have you had what they call creditable coverage from your employer in the last 60 days before you sign up for Medicare? So if you get that form 90 days out or six months out, that's not really going to show Medicare what they want to see when you retire. I know everybody wants to get everything done early, but you can do it too early. So 60 days, between 60 days and 30 days out is the optimum time to do it because that's what they want to see, that you've had coverage within the last, the last 60 days when you sign up. You know, you, you talk about avoiding the $500, and I've heard that a couple of times. Well, my first Medicare bill was like 500 bucks. There's a couple of things that could be. First off, Medicare has a deductible, just like all the other plans. You know, our active employee in January, you've got, is it 750 or $850? Some stupid amount of deductible. The Medicare deductible is $233 a person. So if you start Medicare in June, you know, we're going to do deductible, 233 If it's a couple, you're not 466 So that could be the $500 you're talking about. The other is, if you have not yet started Social Security, say you're going to delay your Social Security 70, but you're going to start your Medicare now, you got to pay for it somehow. There's no Social Security. They're going to send you a bill. And being the government, they don't want to send you a bill every month. So they're going to send it to you quarterly. And your Medicare premiums are 170 bucks a month. Well, um, a uh, 170 times the three months is going to be a $499 bill. So that may be the $500 bill you're hearing about, that your first bill is $500, but you're paying for three months worth. So, um, and then there's one little weird thing that wouldn't apply to us if you don't qualify for free part A because you didn't work enough. Uh, we pre-funding, you know, you get FICA and FUDA, that FUDA is your pre-funding. If you don't have 10 years of FUDA, you have to pay for part A. Um, obviously, that's not, and that's five hundred dollars a month. Um, obviously, that doesn't account because in order to qualify to retire, you have to have your ten years of company seniority. So you've been paying. Great. But you can have ten years of company seniority. I have run into a few people that have the ten years of company seniority, but they had three or four kids, and they may oh, wow. not have that ten years. I've I've talked to maybe two people <laughs> since oh, I've that's been happened to. that that's happened to. Yeah, so wow. it, it happens occasionally, but not very often. Go get married to someone that has the credits and you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question, is there a better month to retire as I'm thinking of retiring in the next four to eight months? I'm out of sick time, so is there a better month that you suggest to retire, such as January 1st? I guess it would depend on it for a lot of people the end of the year because if they've met their you know deductible for insurance and so on then they're starting fresh on January 1st with whatever new coverage they're going to be on if they're going on a spouse's coverage that doesn't really matter you know so it can be whenever you want you know but that's for the end of the year for you know taxes insurance and things like that sometimes it makes sense for people so really the determining factor for an individual could be contingent on you know, what insurance they're lining up, whether it's their spouse or whatever they have. Going Correct. On. Sometimes also it's their Medicare eligibility date, you know, so say their birthday's in February, they decide not to retire, at, you know, until February. So they get through most of the year and a little bit of the next year, you know, so it, it, it really varies according to people's birthdays and the, then what they're going to do about their health benefits seem to be the main criteria. A lot of people like to retire on their anniversary date with the company, so they hit a certain anniversary, and that doesn't have anything to do with anything else that, that they just want to say they had a certain number of years with the company. Or a lot of people retire because they don't want to do drills again. So they retire, they do their base month and their grace month, and they're not going to do drills one more time, they're going to retire. So those seem to be the main criteria. Or maybe you can have a New Year's party be your retirement, retirement party. Retirement party. And the people that forgot to give you a Christmas gift can bring that. <laughs> That's right. Our last question comes from John. He asks, if we retire from American and start a new job, 
Can we transfer our 401ks to a new company and continue paying into it? Um, that's a, a two part question. Yes, you can transfer um, your 401k and you would roll it into your new Walmart 401k plan. Uh, and you can contribute to the Walmart plan based on your uh, Walmart wages that you can't contribute to the American part just out of savings because 401k contributions are all out of, out of wages. Before you do that, however, uh, you might want to figure out what are the fees. So if you would you would ask the Walmart people, what are your 401k fees and see what it would cost to roll your American one in there? Because right now you're paying $200 a year or something in, in management fees in American. It could be different. Out of it could be $2,000 a year right. somewhere else. Could be less. So a financial advisor could also help them make that decision right. whether or not right. to roll. Yeah. Okay. How to protect most of their savings. Yeah. yeah. Good. Well, we covered a lot of ground today. Um, thank you, Kim and Patrick, for uh, all the helpful information. And thank you for joining and um, receiving the information that these two lovely individuals have. Um, thank and, John from the credit. And John, thank you for being on today, John. We really appreciate it. didn't get it. any more questions. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, we know it's. Do you have anything to add, John? Oh, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add one little thing based on the 401k question. Um, one thing I notice a lot of people do when they retire from American or anywhere is that they feel the need to cash out of all their retirement accounts, IRAs, 401ks, and put everything in savings. That's a very rash movement. I would strongly encourage people, don't make any knee-jerk reactions when you retire. Keep the money where it is, meet with an advisor, or at least sit down and understand what you need out of your money and take one step at a time. There's no need to panic and cash out of everything. Really good advice, John. Thank you for that. And thank you again for being on today. We really appreciate it. Of course, happy to do it. Um, any parting thoughts from you guys? Um, like we say, there are a lot of moving pieces. Um, <laughs> I, I always joke that I've done, you know, hundreds of these presentations and I always learn something new. So I, we have people that come to them over and over. Uh, I won't say her name. We had a, a rep. She did 14 of our presentations before she retired. <laughs> and she said she learned something new at everyone. Um, Even though they have to hear the same joke. I know. <laughs> and you better laugh at the same jokes. I'm just saying. Um, but yeah, do not do not feel like you should have already learned it all because it's a lot. It's kind of like being a flight attendant. You come out of training thinking you know a lot and realize, oh yeah, there's a whole lot I don't know. C209, what? Yeah, okay. So uh, don't be afraid to ask questions and don't be afraid to uh, make sure that you use all the resources you have out there. And resources. call us because yeah, call us. we're here to help you put all the moving pieces together there right now. I, I think there should be a concierge service at the company to help people with all this, but there's really not right now. So we're kind of filling that need at the moment as your union and feel free to call us if you're wanting to know the best way to put it all together and we'll help you know steer you in the right direction. So resources, um, this video is recorded. You can, uh, we'll send it out in a hotline afterwards. If there's some stuff you wanna go back and rewatch, you can do that. Um, the good slide packet is on the APFA retirement page that's been sent to the chat. Make sure you go download that or print it off. And then uh, how can they email you? Um, retirement at APFA.org. And what's your extension? 8490 at 817-540-0108. And then extension 8490. Okay. Uh, with that, I think we're done for the day. Thank you again for joining us and fly safely. Uh, and have Thank fun uh, 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 planning your retirement.